The Buddha's instructions for getting the mind into concentration are in his descriptions of right mindfulness. For example, with the body. You keep focused on the body in and of itself. Ardent, alert, and mindful, putting aside greed and distress with reference to the world. The body in itself here means the body simply as it's sitting here right now. You don't think about the body and the world. Because that would give rise to other duties. Is your body attractive enough? Is it strong enough to do the work that needs to be done? That's putting the duties of the world first. And then your body is, has to serve those duties. But when we're developing the mind, training the mind, we have other duties. Duties that put the mind first. The Buddha's duties that put the problem of suffering first. And the best way to keep those duties in mind is simply be with a body in and of itself, how it feels to be with a body right here, right now. For example, with the breath. If you're concerned about the duties of the world, the breath has only one function for you, which is to keep you alive. And so when you're taking on duties for the sake of the world, the breath doesn't have much meaning doesn't play a large role in your awareness. But when you're taking on the duties for the sake of the mind, and for the sake of the well-being of the mind, the breath suddenly plays a much bigger role. It's what you're living with here as you stay with the body. And it's the aspect of the body that you have the most control over it that determines whether the body is going to be a good place to stay or not. So when you look at the body just in and of itself, the relationship of the mind to the breath becomes much more important. And it encourages you to pay a lot of attention to how the breathing feels. And at the same time to work with it, to make it a good place to stay. This is the duty of mindfulness, is to remember we're not here just to watch things, we're here to figure out cause and effect so we can make the present moment a good place to stay, where we can observe the mind carefully. You think about the Buddha's image of the practice as being like building a fortress, and peopling it with people to defend the fortress. The first line of defense is mindfulness. The mindfulness is the gatekeeper. Now, the gatekeeper doesn't just sit there watching people coming in going out. He has to recognize who are the friends, who are enemies. If he recognizes friends, he lets them in. If he recognizes that people are enemies, or if he sees they're people you can't trust, he does his best to keep them out. He's not a mannequin gatekeeper. Sometimes you hear that mindfulness is simply being aware of things arising and passing away. But that's like a mannequin policeman. You know those towns where they don't have enough money to pay for an, enough police, and so they take a mannequin, they put it in a police car, and they park it by the side of the road to get people to slow down. Now that may work in a few cases, but if you drive past that spot often, you begin to realize this is a mannequin, it's not a real policeman, and then it doesn't have any effect anymore. In the same way, there are some defilements in the mind, some causes for suffering in the mind, where all you have to do is look at them squarely, and they get embarrassed and they, they disappear. Mannequin mindfulness works with things like that. But there are other defilements who have no sense of shame at all. You look at them and, look, and they just stare right back. They just keep on doing what they want to do. That's when you need a real gatekeeper, someone who is more proactive and remembers his duties. That's the function of mindfulness, is to keep something in mind. In this case, we keep our duties in mind. And the duties here are the duties for the Four Noble Truths. These are duties for the sake of your well-being. 
The first duty is to comprehend suffering. That's the first noble truth, and its duty is to comprehend it. Now, comprehending it here means we understand it to the point of dispassion. You ordinarily wouldn't think that we're passionate for our suffering. But as the Buddha said, suffering isn't something that just happens to us. We, act, we actually go out and do it. We cling to things, thinking that it's worthwhile clinging to them. And we tend to ignore the drawbacks. It's like holding a vicious animal in your hand, because the animal has something you like. Maybe it has a nice fur coat or something. But then it bites and bites and bites. And it's as if we refuse to see the connection between the fact that we're holding on to the fur coat and getting bitten at the same time. So when the Buddha says to comprehend suffering, he wants us to see the connection between our attachment to the fur coat and the, the teeth of the animal. And realizing that it's not worth it. Now, the duty with regard to the second noble truth, which is the cause of suffering, that's to abandon it. The reason we're holding on to the animal is we've got craving for it. Either because we think it's something fascinating, just it, it's a beautiful coat, fur coat that it has that we want, or we want the fur coat because it gives us a sense of status. We are the person who has the fur coat, either a fur coat that we want for ourselves or we want to give to somebody else. And then there's a, the, the craving that doesn't like a state of becoming, being that person with the fur coat, and it wants to destroy it. All these things involve suffering, lead to suffering. Particularly the first one, this is called craving for sensuality. Sensuality here doesn't mean sensual pleasures so much as it means our fascination with thinking about sensual pleasures. We can plan and plan and plan, say, a meal for the meal we want to have when we leave the retreat, where we want to go, what kind of food we want to order, or where we're going to go home, what kind of food we want to make. And you can think about that for whole hours. You are attached to that thinking more than we are to the actual food. Say, for example, you've made up your mind you want a pizza at a particular restaurant. You go there, and the restaurant's closed. You say, well, that's too bad, but you think of another place you want to go right away. If you were told that you couldn't think about that kind of thing, you would rebel. It's because you're really attached to the thinking. Because thinking about sensual, sensual pleasures all the time gives rise to a sense of lack. And that lack is what leads the mind to do unskillful things that lead to suffering. So that's what you want to let go of. When you can do that, then you follow up with the, the duty for the third noble truth, the cessation of suffering, which is to realize it. In other words, realizing that when you let go of craving, suffering ends. There may be stress in the world outside, problems in the world outside, but the suffering that weighs down the mind, that's gone. You want to see that clearly. And you do that by developing the path. That's a duty with the fourth noble truth. The qualities of the path are not there yet, we give rise to them. When they are there, you try to maintain them and develop them. So this is what your gatekeeper has to remember. For instance, concentration arises in the mind, and then it goes away. You don't just say, well, that's the nature of concentration, nature of things to arise and pass away, thinking that it's discernment. Actually, it's simply not doing your duty. Your duty is to try to figure out how to get that concentration back. Try to remember what gave rise to it to begin with. Can I recreate those causes again? And if I can't, well, then keep watchful, watchful for the next time when concentration arises, so you can see the connection between what you do 
and how the mind settles down. So this becomes a skill. Now part of the skill in creating a state of concentration, we are, stating, we are creating a state of becoming. Becoming is an identity you take on in a particular world of experience. It's all centered around a desire. So you have that desire for a fur coat. Okay, everything in the world that is related to the fur coat is part of that world. Things that are not related to that fur coat, either they don't help in gaining the fur coat or they don't form obstacles to the fur coat, those are not part of that particular becoming at all. Then there's you that takes on an identity, both the you that wants the fur coat and will enjoy the fur coat when you get it, and the you that can provide it. All of that together, that's the state of becoming. Usually when we think about becoming, we think about levels of becoming up in heaven or in hell. In other words, things outside. And there is that level of becoming. We're on the human level right now. But those outside becomings come from the becomings in the mind. You have a picture of something you want, and all the things that are related to that something you want suddenly appear in the mind. And then you go in and you figure out how you're going to get it. And that happens how many times in the course of a day? It's our desire for those things, our craving for that kind of process. That's what leads to suffering. But in the Buddha's approach, we have to create one state of becoming so that we can let go of the others. And that's the state of coming, becoming, which is concentration. The world of your concentration right now is your sense of your body as you feel it from inside. You're the meditator trying to get the mind to settle down. That's the becoming you're going to hold on to. Like a John Cha story. You're coming back from the market, you've bought a banana. Someone asks you, why are you holding the banana? He said, because I want to eat it. And then they ask you, are you going to eat the peel as well? No. Then why are you holding that? And the John Cha says, what are you going to ans ask, answer that person with? And his answer has two levels. The first level is, you've got to have the desire to come up with a good answer. So you answer with desire. He's pointing to the fact that we need desire on the path. Not all desire is a cause of suffering. Some Skillful desires are actually part of the path. And the second part of the answer is, the time hasn't come to let go of the peel yet. If I let go of it now, the banana will become mush in my hands. It's the same with the mind. You're trying to get it to understand suffering. You need to have a good place to stay in concentration. You're trying to understand all your other mind's attraction to other forms of becoming. You need this form of becoming to hold on to, both to understand the process of becoming and to compare this state of becoming with others, seeing that this one is a lot better. So this is why we work at developing this state of becoming as part of the path. This is one of the duties that our gatekeeper has to remember. You're trying to figure out the mind and concentration. You don't just watch it come and go. When it comes, you ask yourself, how did it come? What did I do? When it goes, you ask yourself, what did I do? After all, you start seeing connections, and the concentration becomes a skill. That's how you develop the path. Now, in the beginning, it may seem like a lot of work. We come here, with the, we want the mind to settle down and be still, and it is not much stillness. It is grappling with staying with the breath, then losing it, then coming back, and then losing it again. But remember, we're building a home for the mind here. If you have a place where you want to build a home, you don't just lie down there. Tell yourself, okay, I've got my resting spot. You first have to put up a roof. You put up walls. You have windows and doors you can open and close. You fix all the things that are necessary for a home. That's when you lie down. So even though there may be some frustration in noticing the mind slipping off, each time you've caught the mind slipping off, okay, remember, your gatekeeper is at work. 
catching these things. If the gatekeeper weren't catching these things, you'd just be wandering around and who knows what thoughts. You're training your gatekeeper to get more and more alert. so that it knows its duties. Otherwise we keep doing the wrong things. There's a famous meditation monk in Bangkok years back. His name was Joe Kun Na. He was doing walking meditation in front of his hut one night, and this young monk came up and said, I've been harassed by these thoughts all day. I can't get rid of them. Joe Kun Na looked at him. Said, you're doing the wrong duty. Turned around, went back in his hut. Fortunately, the young monk had been studying the Dharma, and as soon as he heard the word duty, he was thinking, well, the duties are the Four Noble Truths. He was developing the thoughts instead of letting them go. Or you might say, whatever it was that was causing the thoughts, he was trying to let go of the thoughts without letting go of the, the cause. John Fuang tells a similar story. He was harassed with severe headaches when he was young. He tried Chinese medicine, Thai medicine, Western medicine, nothing worked. It got so bad that he had to have monks staying in his room at night in case he got up in pain, because he said even if he just lay down, as soon as his head hit the pillow, there would be pain come up. So one night he woke up in the middle of the night, got up, and the monks who were supposed to be looking after him were all asleep. He asked himself, who's looking after whom here? Then he told him, so, well, as long, long as I'm up, I might as well meditate. And as he was meditating, he suddenly realized he was following the wrong duty. He was trying to abandon the pain of the headache without searching for the cause. So he looked for the cause and he found it. So he realized, one, that the pain of the headache and the suffering, those are two separate things. And if you look for the cause of the suffering, that's something you can abandon. So try to train your gatekeeper so that he remembers your duties as you're sitting here, the duties that are there for the sake of the mind, sake of the well-being of the mind. As for any other duties that have, for the sake of the world, you can put them aside right now. This is your time. And the Buddha teaches these duties not because he's imposing them on you, but it's because they're for your genuine well-being. And so when your gatekeeper is well-trained, you'll be working for your well-being at all times of the day and night. <coughs> 